Darren has given a very nice introduction actually to, um, to what I was going to talk about, which is the stability of some of these uh, one of the ones that uh, um, we like calculated, but we'll, uh, we'll get to that. This is joint work, by the way, with uh, with Emilian um, Perel, one of the uh, So I was just a little bit um, on the history of stability, perhaps, just very, very briefly. So there's a very famous picture that many people have seen before of uh, Benjamin and Fears experiments in a large, a large tank. So there's two photographs here. The upper one is a train of Stokes waves that are created at the, at the head of the tank. And then uh, further downstream, this modulational instability kicks in that was analyzed by Benjamin. <laughs> uh, and, and it all starts to disrupt and become become uh, irregular further further down the street. Um, so I'm not going to attempt to review all the papers on stability. There's a, there's a huge number of things. So we just picked out a few um, of the relevant ones. Uh, I apologize to anyone whose name is not on the next uh, three slides. Uh, please complain to me later. Um, <laughs> But let me just pick out some of the, the important things for what I want to what I want to talk about. Um, Longer Higgins's papers in the late 70s um, distinguish between superharmonic and subharmonic instability. So superharmonic means that the wavelength of your perturbation is the same as the base wave or a fraction of it, and subharmonic is longer. So this is going to be important later if that terminology is not familiar. Uh, McKay and Safman in 1986 showed that uh, an instability has to arise through a collision of eigenvalues, um, but that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Okay, so you need a collision to occur, and you may or may not get instability off. Um, what else to say? So that's pure gravity waves, that slide. Uh, and then gravity, capillary waves, um, stability of capillary waves there, and standing waves um, as well. And then the main subject of this talk and Darren's is to include vorticity, uh, in particular constant vorticity. So I guess the idea here is you're modeling some kind of shear current is the, is the thinking. Um, so I should certainly pick out uh, Jean Locke's contributions here in 96, um, that Darren has talked about, and then her and Wheeler in 2020, which is very much what I, what I want to say. Okay, so here's the basic uh, setup. There's a free surface, that's the blue line, um, and waves propagating along that, that speed, little c. Then the flow is inverted, incompressible, but not irrotational as a constant vorticity field. And I'm sorry that I'm going to switch notation now. So Darren Zeta was, um, was, uh, was something else. I, I need omega to be frequency in a minute. Okay, so I'm going to use zeta for vorticity. So you have Poisson's equation to solve in the bulk of the fluid, which goes on forever down here. Okay, so it's infinitely deep water. Uh, psi has got a bar on it because um, I want to remove that in a second, so you'll see what happens. So psi is the stream function. We've got Poisson's equation for that, and that's the that's the basic one. Okay. So oh, and I ignore gravity, right? Which I don't feel so embarrassed about now because Darren has just justified um, why that's a good idea. So if we start with Poisson's equation in the bulk of the fluid, and then we redefine the stream function now to get rid of this zeta on the right hand side. So we introduce a shifted stream function psi, so it doesn't have a bar on top of it, um, like that. And then we get Laplace's equation for psi in the, uh, in the main part of the fluid. Okay, so that's a bit nicer. And then because you have Laplace's equation for psi, you can introduce a conjugate function, um, we call that phi, which is sort of almost, but not quite the velocity potential. But I'll probably just call it the velocity potential wrongly. Okay. And so that satisfies Laplace's equation as well. Okay, I'm just going to include gravity temporarily and then knock it out in a second. So if you include gravity, you get the full, um, what would be the full water wave problem if you also drop vorticity out. Okay, so there's Laplace's equation for the, uh, the velocity potential in inverted commas, then the kinematic condition, which includes the vorticity um, here, and then the dynamic condition, which comes by virtue of the uh, the, the extension of Bernoulli's um, theorem to constant vorticity that Darren just talked about. So in the dynamic condition, there's vorticity contributions through those two terms. And as I said, I've included gravity temporarily, and then a long way below the surface, everything is everything's stationary. Okay, if you look for small amplitude traveling waves then to get a dispersion relation out of this in the normal way, then, so we introduce eta, eta is the free surface shape. So introduce a small amplitude perturbation, wave number K, frequency omega. Then you get to this dispersion relation here. So again, zeta is the constant vorticity field. Um, 
And if you take the limit as, um, well, okay, sorry, I'll do that in a second. So one wave's going to the right, one wave's going to the left. If you take the limit as gravity disappears, well, first of all, here's the dispersion relation with gravity, right, that everybody knows about, plus or minus square root of gk in deep water. If you knock out gravity, then that dispersion relation at the top reduces to this form, and it doesn't have k in it anymore. So it doesn't depend on the wave. So there are two um, frequencies, zeta the constant vorticity field, drop the constant, and, and zero. Right? And they're independent of k. So that kind of suggests that you should be able to construct in quite an elementary way a, a resonant triad right? in the sense of, uh, of Phillips, like in 60. If we see introduced this idea, and this was talked about very nicely yesterday as well, and he was doing it for pure gravity waves on deep water, for which there is no resonant triad. Right? It's, I think it's a quartet post. So the conditions for such a triad are these. You need um, uh, two perturbations interacting with the base wave to give a resonance. Um, and they must satisfy these conditions. The three wave numbers must add up, uh, give or take these minus signs to zero, and the frequencies as well. And the frequencies must satisfy the, uh, the dispersion relations. So that doesn't work for, for gravity uh, waves on them. But in this case, it will, kind of trivially, actually, because the, the dispersion relation is independent of k. So, for example, if we take the if we tune the base wave so its wavelength is two pi, and so its wave number is one, um, and it's got frequency zeta, <laughs> then we just take two other waves with wave number two and one, and then trivially two minus one is one, so it fits this equation, and zeta minus zero is zeta, so it fits that. One. So we get this resonant triangle. This is going to become relevant later, so I'll come, I'll come back to this point. Okay, so here's the problem again, but now I'm going to shift into a traveling frame. So what I really want to do is analyze the stability of, of, the, of the base wave. And I'll discuss what the base waves are in a minute, okay, although Darren has already done that. So we shift into a frame that's traveling at the constant um, wave speed C. So that means now down at minus infinity, so Y is the vertical coordinate, down at minus infinity, there is a, a current going left at speed little C, and also this vorticity contribution. Right. If we non-dimensionalize at this stage, so let's take one over k. So k is the wave number of the base wave okay, that I haven't introduced yet. So that can be the length scale and the time scale one over k c, where c is the wave speed. We get to this single dimensionless parameter. There's no gravity now because okay, so the gravity has been thrown out. Well, this dimensionless parameter quantifies the strength of the vorticity field, and I'll call it capital omega. Now the linear dispersion relation suggested that the frequency little omega, which is k times c, looks like zeta. Okay, that was one of the uh, one of the results from the from the dispersion relation. So if you put that into there, that gets, makes capital omega one. So that kind of suggests that there ought to be a, a traveling wave branch bifurcating from capital omega equal one. Okay, so before we get to that, let me just formulate how I'm going to think about this problem. Again, thinking that I want to analyze stability of these things. So a convenient way to do that is to reformulate the problem again in terms of surface variables. So we know how to do this from, uh, from Diachenko et al, 1996. And the basic idea is to use a conformal mapping to, mul multi uh, to map the, the physical problem here into the eta zeta. So into a strip in the complex plane, and then to formulate everything in terms of surface variables at eta equals naught, which you can do because you're dealing with harmonic functions, like sine phi, satisfy Laplace's equation. So we introduce phi tilde, which is the surface trace of the velocity potential phi, defined variable, et cetera, and all the surface traces of all the other variables. The Jacobian J that's going to pop up on the next slide and the Hilbert transform perhaps unexpectedly comes in as well. So we'll skip all the details. This is what you end up with. Two equations, uh, four equations. Two comprising the dynamic condition and the kinematic condition. So the top one is basically Bernoulli's equation we had before, now rewritten in terms of all these surface variables. And notice the appearance of capital omega. That's my dimensionless vorticity parameter. The Hilbert transform and this Jacobian and so on. Okay, but I mentioned there ought to be a traveling wave branch bifurcating from omega equals one. Okay, so here it is. So this is omega on the horizontal axis. Capital H is the wave height, right? So the difference in distance between the, 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 the peak and the trough. 
If we look for steadily traveling waves, considering that I formulated the problem in a frame traveling with this putative wave, then to get to those, I just knock out the time derivatives in my equations and look for solutions x tilde, y tilde are just functions of zeta. Okay, so zeta is this parameter in the conformally mapped plane. Okay, well, we can find solutions to this. In fact, we don't need to find them. They already have been found. And the solution is given by this formula at the top, x naught plus i, y naught is that thing on the right-hand side, where this parameter capital A is connected to this parameter capital omega. So A is, A is you can kind of think of A as the amplitude of the wave, which is definitely true for small, for small height um, waves. So in capital omega is one, little a is naught here. And then this solution describes waves all the way along this branch, which stops at that point, or at least physically stops at that point. So I can continue mathematically. What do the waves look like? So they look like this. These are the, the crapper waves that Darren was talking about and which have been um, described analytically by her and Wheeler in this recent paper in 2020. Okay, the key point being that this is what Darren has already made very eloquently, that although the, the, the problem is, is different, so here's Crapper's problem. Crapper 1957 is inviscid irritational flow under a free surface with surface tension on the free surface. The free point is there's a gamma there, surface tension on the free surface. And in the problem I'm talking about, there's no surface tension, no gravity, there's just a constant vorticity field. But you turn out to get exactly the same surface profile. So I won't linger on this point because that was the subject of the, of the previous talk. Now, in the limiting case, the limiting profile looks like this and it traps a little bubble of air. Okay, so these are these are A increasing as you go up um, through, the, through the profiles and the limiting one, it traps a little bubble of air. And that's why the traveling wave branch stops at that point to the right. Okay, so it's these waves that I want to look at the, uh, look at the stability of. Perhaps one other point to make actually before I do that, is that although the surface profiles look the same, you wouldn't expect the flow underneath the surface to look the same, and it very much does not. But I don't want to linger on this too much because Vera will talk about it uh, after the break. So this is what the flow looks like and with the constant vorticity. In fact, this, this, uh, this figure is, is stolen from your paper. Okay. And as you might expect with vorticity, there are eddies uh, circulating underneath the earth. Right, okay, so this is, the, this is really the main subject of the talk now, is to look at the stability of these, uh, these constant vorticity surface profiles. So how might we do that? Well, this is conveniently done in this surface variable formulation that I introduced a minute ago. We take the base wave, we're looking at the X variable, for example, so the subscript zero means the base wave, the traveling wave, and the subscript one is the perturbation. So we introduce small perturbations, plug them into the, uh, into the governing equations, Okay, so there are the two governing equations, plug them into there. And since we're perturbing about a wave, which is itself a periodic traveling wave, we will get equations whose coefficients are periodic in zeta. Right, so I have a stability problem for an eigenvalue little sigma in red, okay, whose coefficients are periodic functions of zeta. So that suggests that you need to use flow k theory. So that leads you to the ansatz written at the top of the page. Notice this little p, constant just in front of the sum that is what designates whether we're looking at superharmonic or subharmonic perturbations so p equals zero is a subharmonic perturbation p uh, between zero and one if i just said that right p equals naught is superharmonic p between zero and one is sub right, so the aim of the game is to determine sigma and in particular to see if it's got a real part sigma will be complex in general the way that this is formulated I want to know, is the real part of sigma greater than zero, in which case I have instability. Okay, now there's some symmetries in this problem. So this was, uh, this is very similar to what was pointed out by Tyrone and Joy in uh, 2012 for the Crapper problem. We're looking at the stability of Crapper. There are these nice symmetries in the, uh, in the stability equations, which basically means you can reduce the search for P or the range of P that you need to consider down from zero, one to zero and a half. Okay, so before going to look at, look at the stability of all the waves along the uh, Wheeler branch, let's think first of all about the stability of the flat state. Okay, so no waves, the free surface is perfectly flat, we perturb about that. So that's what's happening on this slide. 
So the basic state now is given by x naught equals psi, etc. And the key point is that y naught is zero. Three surfaces, so it's flat. Now omega is one, so I'm I'm right down at the bifurcation point on the traveling wave branch where omega is equal to one. But it's kind of convenient to leave omega in the equations anyway, because it makes it a little bit nicer to see what's going on. So I'm going to do that even though omega is equal to one. So the perturbation form doesn't have this sum now. We just look for a, a monochromatic wave, effectively of wave number n plus p. Plug that in, I want to know sigma. So you do that, turn grind through the algebra, you get a quadratic equation of sigma. So two roots, two eigenvalues. So I'm going to label these sigma subscript one and sigma subscript two, and this is what you find. n plus p is like the wavelength of the perturbation. So p is this flow k parameter that quantifies whether you're doing subharmonic or supermodic harmonic perturbations, and n is an integer. Now, if you set p equals naught, what you find is that these eigenvalues are all, uh, uh, are mostly, let's say, double. So for example, I can construct i times n as an eigenvalue if n is not equal to naught, two different ways, either by using my first sigma and setting, um, or just choosing n, or by using the second one and choosing n plus one if n's positive. Okay, so I can construct the eigenvalue i times n where n is any integer that's not zero in two different ways, so it's double. And zero I, I can construct from these formulae at the top four different ways, so that's quadruple. Okay, so the spectrum for p equals naught has got integers up the positive imaginary axis and down the negative imaginary axis all double, and the origin is quadruple. Now, if p is between naught and one, so this is subharmonic perturbations, then it's kind of similar. Now I can construct i n plus p in two different ways, kind of the same as before. So that's double, as long as this time n is not zero or minus one. Because if n is, um, well, because in these cases, right, if n is, if n is uh, zero here, i p can be made three different ways. So this one's triple. And if n is minus one, I can make minus one plus p times i three different ways again, yeah, as is illustrated here. So those are true. But slightly different now. We've got double eigenvalues and triples if p is non zero. And if p is zero, we've got doubles and quadruples. So this is a summary of all that. Okay, so here's the complex zeta plane. The red dots up the positive and negative imaginary axis are my double eigenvalues at the locations. And there's a, at the origin, this light blue color is the quadruple. So that's p equals naught, super harmonic. Subharmonic case, I've got two triples at p and minus one plus p, and then everything else is double. Okay, right. The fact that we've got double eigenvalues here now occurring kind of suggests there should be some connection with this resonant interaction that I mentioned earlier. So I want to go back to that now and draw a, a parallel. The growth rate I'm computing, little sigma, in this traveling wave frame. Is related to omega, the frequency of the dispersion relation I computed before, through this formula at the top, with this blue term, the ikc naught, representing the fact that I've shifted the frame between a stationary lab frame and a move. C naught here is just the speed of the infinitesimally um, flat, infinite, small amplitude traveling wave, and that's just one. So if I have a double eigenvalue, and I constructed double eigenvalues by choosing effectively two wave numbers that were different by one. Okay, so if I take k1 to be greater than zero and k2 K to be k1 plus one, that's how I got to my double. And I put in the formula from the previous slide, I get this relation here between the two frequencies of my perturbations of wavelength k1 and k2. Well, k2 minus k1 is just one by construction. If I go back to my dispersion relation from before, I had one frequency zeta and the other one zero, but I've non-dimensionalized since then. So one of those frequencies is now one, not zeta. So my two frequencies are one and zero, right? And trivially, one minus zero equals one. The, third, the frequency of the first perturbation minus that of the second is equal to the frequency of the base wave. So you have this resonant triad interaction, varying from this double eigenvalue. So that kind of suggests that maybe there's some instability going on here at small amplitude. So that motivates then starting to think about what happens when A is non-zero. So we move away from the flat case now 
the small amplitude waves. If we take her and Wheeler's solutions, that's the capital X naught Y naught, and expand in capital A, it's capital A is the wave amplitude. And you take the, the, the nice simple formula that is effectively the same as Crapper's solution and expand in A, this is what you get at the top. Yeah. And similarly for phi naught and such. And we look for solutions to our stability problem. These are the perturbations with the subscript one. In a similar way to before, e to the sigma t times some function of zeta. Then you get this problem here, written in compact form. So some operator times u, which is the perturbation eigenvector, is the eigenvalue sigma that I want to know times u. Okay. So then I expand in capital A. So I'm going to expand the operator, capital L, the eigenvector u, and the eigenvalue. <laughs> now at leading order, sigma naught is the growth rate for the flat state. And we just discussed those are all on the imaginary axis. So they're all imaginary. So there's no instability. So really what I want to know is what's sigma one, the first perturbation at order A. Okay, so plug those expansions into the, uh, into the stability problem. At leading order, you get what you expect. Okay, so L naught is the leading order operator effectively for the flat state. In essence, what I've talked about already. And sigma naught, as I said, is on the, uh, it's on the imaginary axis. So of interest is what happens at first order. So you go to first order and you get this problem to solve. So this is now a forced version of the leading order problem. Right? So you get the same, the zeroth order operator on the left-hand side, sigma naught being purely imaginary, with some forcing on the right-hand side, which comes from the first order part of the operator acting on the leading order eigenvector. Right, well, Fred Holm's alternative tells me that there's a solution to this problem. As long as R1 is orthogonal, to the kernel of the adjoint. Yeah. So there's going to be a solvability condition on this. I need R1 to satisfy some criteria in order for there to be a solution of uh, sigma one. Right, so that makes us that takes us to looking at the kernel, the null space of the leading order operator, the adjoint of that. By the way, what I'm talking about now, this, um, this, this, this perturbation, is, is essentially following a program that was laid out by Akers and Nichols. So there's a lot of detail in their paper. And also, this has been done recently by uh, Olga um, and by, uh, by Wu Yong with Sunao Murashita. Okay, so there's a lot of detail here, but really all I want from this slide is I want to know what are the eigenvectors of the adjoint operator. Okay, and they take this form. Notice the n plus p. So it's e to the i n plus p psi and n plus p plus s. Well, s is just the sign of n plus p, so you can think of that as one. And the adjoint eigenvectors are the same, but with different coefficients. So I've got my adjoint eigenvectors. I can now use those to solve my forced problem okay, by Fred Holmes' alternative. So to, to, to do that, I expand the leading order eigen, uh, eigenvector in terms of these, uh, this eigenspace from the kernel. Write the forcing on the right-hand side using that and then project my equation onto the two eigenvectors. So the two eigenvectors in the null space, I do that projection twice using each eigenvector once, I'm gonna get two equations. Okay. And this is the result. And the simplest way to think of this since I've got two equations is as a matrix system. Okay. So what it all boils down to is a matrix, this matrix eigenvalue problem, okay. a two by two matrix. And the important thing is what's sigma one? It's now an eigenvalue of this problem. To solve that, System, calculate the eigenvalue, and this is what you find. So sigma one is given by that formula, and the thing under the square root is positive. And there's no i's there, so sigma one is plus or minus a real number. So the thing is unstable. And it's unstable for any a, because I, I perturb with a. So as soon as you make a non-zero, so you have a flat state, as soon as you go anywhere up the branch, so you've got waves present, they're unstable in, immediately. That seemed a, a little bit surprising. So what's happening here is that my double eigenvalue, so this is the superharmonic case, is splitting apart and going out into the complex plane, one left and one right. And what the triples do, the triples do something similar. So you can do a similar analysis for the triples, calculate sigma one, and it turns out to be that formula there. Two of the triples, so the triple breaks apart as well. Two of them go left and right, and one heads off up the, uh, up the imaginary axis. And again, you get the stability immediately for any non-zero A. But what if you want to go further up the traveling wave branch? So now this is into a, a numerical problem. 
And what this slide is essentially saying is that you solve that numerical problem using a collocation method. So you put collocation points all the way along one period of your wave and then discretize everything. And then you get a generalized eigenvalue problem here. You want to know what sigma is. And you can solve that on MATLAB very easily. And here are the results. So the horizontal axis here is the real part of sigma. That's what I'm really interested in. That's telling me if it's unstable or not. And the vertical axis is the imaginary part. So what we see here on the vertical axis are what I would have had if capital A was zero. Everything's imaginary. And then these two branches here are for two different values of capital A. This picture here is just a close up of that one, by the way. So if you just look at the one on the left, it's easier. And what's happening is that this double eigenvalue here, for example, is splitting apart. One's going to the right. There's another one going left, which I haven't shown because the whole picture is just symmetric. All of these eigenvalues split and go out into the complex plane instantaneously for any a greater than zero. And this slide is just demonstrating that same thing again, but comparing with the asymptotic results. So I did this expansion in capital A. It would be nice to see if that agrees with the numerics. So rather than discussing all these figures, if we perhaps just focus on this one, that's the real part of sigma and the horizontal axis is A. So as A increases, the real part of sigma starts out at zero, then it splits apart and you get two, one with positive real part, one with negative real part. And the broken line, which you can just about see, is the asymptotic theorem. So that seems to confirm what we're finding from the new Right, what about larger values of A? So the, the picture I showed you a minute ago is for a very small A. What about if A gets bigger? So here's some typical results. Uh, what's interesting about these, these figures? So maybe on the left-hand one, so what, what you're looking at here is the complex sigma plane. So the, amount, the, the horizontal axis is the real part of sigma, the vertical axis is the imaginary part. And I think what's interesting about the left-hand figure is this sort of figure eight type structure, which um, those who are familiar with gravity wave stability calculations um, might think looks similar to what you find in that case. So for stability of... Um, gravity waves, you also see this figure eight centered at the centered at the origin. But the way it's constructed here is rather different. Now, I won't go into that because I'm wanting to run short of time. But the construction is different, but it's 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 very striking that you see a similar structure. What about um, on the right hand side? The different colored lines here are different values of capital A, the amplitude of the traveling wave. So Black here is small amplitude, and they all come into the, uh, the they all come in um, to zero amplitude here uh, following that asymptotic uh, limit that I discussed before. And blue here, I've chosen the value 0.43, so that's that's this branch here. That corresponds to an overturning wave. So as you go up the the branch of um, the traveling wave branch, the waves get steeper and steeper, eventually overturn, and eventually they trap a bubble. So the case 0.43 here is when they've overturned, but before you get to the trap bubble. So we're able to capture the stability of overturning waves in this calculation. But what's also striking about this, I think, is that all these curves in the right hand, plot, they all kind of splay outwards. So as you go higher up the vertical axis, which is like increasing the frequency of the perturbation, it looks from this result, and by the way, any higher than the graph I'm showing here, it gets very difficult to compute numerically with any, uh, with any confidence. But it looks like as you increase the frequency of the perturbation, the growth rate just gets bigger and bigger. And on the face of that it seems to be kind of unbounded, which is a bit strange. And I'm not quite sure what this means, but it, it sort of feels like it's suggesting some sort of ill posedness in the problem. I'm not sure. But on the basis of that, we thought it'd be interesting to do an unsteady simulation. So to take the, the surface variable formulation of the problem, take a traveling wave solution, perturb about that, and then set off an unsteady simulation. And here's an example of that. So the top slide, the solid curve is one of the upper traveling waves. The blue dotted line is the, is the um, initial condition. So it's a small perturbation of that at t equals naught. And I've exaggerated so that we can see it. Okay? The, the perturbation is a lot smaller in amplitude than we're looking at. And then a short while later in dimensionless time units, so 9.25, this is the free, so the black line then is the initial condition. The blue line is the free surface, and it looks very much as though it's trying to form corner or two corners. Okay, so that's that's pretty much everything I, I wanted to say. So just to summarize, what have we done? Look, uh, looked at a stability analysis of her and Wheeler's um, solutions from 2020, and I guess the key message is that these are unstable for any finite amplitude. 
And it seems from the last graph that I showed you that there may be um, formation of, of corners at finite time in unsteady simulations in this problem. And I will finish there. Thank you for listening.